morning, everybody. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue, and thank you all for, for joining us. Migration from the Northern Triangle of Central America is a big, hot topic nowadays. If you turned on the news or check social media in recent weeks, you will have seen coverage of pending ice raids, overflowing detention facilities, and stopgap solutions such as safe third country agreements, and increased enfor enforcement along Mexico's southern border. Less time, however, has been devoted to analyzing the conditions that caused migrants to leave Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador in the first place. And although the high levels of violence in the Northern Triangle are common knowledge, the particular challenge of gender-based violence is underreported and understudied, including as it relates to migration. Indeed, although men in the Northern Triangle countries have greater exposure to violence as a whole, women are disproportionately more likely to experience violence within a relationship or from a former partner. In the region, 84% of victims of intimate partner homicide are women. Today's event, Nowhere to Turn, Gender-Based Violence in the Northern Triangle and its Impact on Migration, will take a hard look at these issues. We are very grateful for the partnership with the Seattle International Foundation in organizing this session. From the dialogue, I want to thank Michael Camilleri, who directs our Rule of Law program, colleague Tamar Ziff, who works closely with Michael, as well as Manuel Orozco, who heads our Migration, Remittances, and Development program, and who will be moderating the session. We owed a particularly huge debt to Eric Olson, a longtime friend who now serves as director of the Seattle International Foundation's Central America program and knows more about the Northern Triangle countries than anyone I know. I don't know a lot of people, so I just, yeah, okay. It's, uh, it's an enormous pleasure to be uh, Eric's opening act this morning, and uh, I'd like to invite him to frame today's discussion, provide a little substance, and uh, introduce our excellent speak speakers. As a reminder, today's conversation will be in English and Spanish, so please make use of the translation headsets that are available at the front desk. So again, thank you, thank you all for coming. I um, look forward to a great discussion. And Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. It's always a pleasure to uh, partner with you, um, as we've done over the years, and delighted to be here today for this special event. I want to thank also um, Michael Camarelli for, for bringing this idea to us at the foundation. We're delighted to uh, partner with you on that, Tamar Ziff as well. And, uh, you know, uh, Michael always exaggerates, I have to say. Uh, there's no one that knows Central America better in this town than Manuel Orozco, who is Central American himself. He knows two people, that's what it is. So anyway, I would just want to acknowledge Mike, uh, Manuel's uh, role and leadership on a variety of issues, not just on remittances, but Nicaragua and other Central America issues. So thank you, uh, uh, Michael, I mean, Manuel, for being part of this. Um, and I want to just extend a special welcome to our uh, panelists th this morning. I'll introduce them more in just a minute, but thank you all for being part of this uh, effort today. Um, as Michael Shifter has said, this is a much, this issue of gender-based violence as a motivator uh, and part of the decision to migrate has been much overlooked uh, in, in studies and in the studies around the migration question. Um, let me just provide you a few uh, data points to try to grasp the severity and the seriousness of this issue. In 2018, there were 10,367 cases of domestic violence brought before the Honduran courts. This is according to a government agency. That's an average of 28 cases per day over 365 days. These are only the ones brought to the court. Presumably, there are many more cases that are never reported. Only 30% 
of those cases actually result in prosecution, uh, prosecution and sentencing. And we don't really know what the results of the sentencing is because those sort of data is not kept. So women's expectations that their case, uh, uh, their search for uh, justice uh, and protection uh, will be uh, taken seriously is seriously undermined by these statistics. I had here some of the same uh, uh, issues that, that Michael mentioned. I guess we're reading the same report, the latest report from the UN ODC that includes a big chapter on uh, violence against uh, women and sexual violence that really, even though 20% of hom uh, women experience 20% of overall homicides, uh, as many as 84% of homicides involving an intimate partner uh, affect women, and a much less number affect men. And finally, according to a Wilson study, an IDB project I oversaw in 2017, we did uh, major surveys of incarcerated women in Latin America, including in Central America, and we found that there were numerous commonalities, what I would call risk factors, in their childhood experiences, including experiencing direct violence at home in 42% of the cases and experiencing indirect violence, violence between uh, adults in the house, but they're present uh, in 35% of cases. So that's 77% of incarcerated women in the region, including in Central America, have experienced domestic violence, indirectly or directly. Other factors that are of interest included substance abuse at the home, economic vulnerability, and broken or fractured, fractured family uh, uh, structures. So violence against women is extensive, it's pervasive, and impunity for perpetrators rules the day. That's why we think it's important to try to delve in, look deeper into these issues, what's causing it, and how states are responding or not responding, and how it may be an incentive for migration. Let me briefly introduce our speakers, a, a terrific lineup of folks. Uh, we'll start with uh, Cor Corey O'Rourke. Uh, Corey is a, a, an immigration attorney at AYUTHA, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit that serves low-income immigrants in humanitarian and family-based immigration cases. And I'll just point out, 30-some uh, years ago, I started out as a volunteer at a UNA, doing uh, uh, asylum intake cases for Central Americans. So this has been an issue for many, many years, and sadly, we're back at it. And I have to say, uh, it's very disappointing. Um, uh, Corey focuses her work uh, with adults and children who have been victims of trafficking, crime, and domestic violence. Next, we'll hear from Claudia Maria Isaguirre Mejia. She is the executive director of the Young Women's Christian Association, probably better known as the YWCA in Honduras, and has been a member of Honduras's National Health Committee. She has focused much of her work on women and violence prevention and, sa excuse me, and safety issues. She is also, and I'll just point this out here, a, a member of the cohort of Centro America Adelante. That's a program, a leadership development program funded by the Seattle International Foundation. This year's recipients uh, uh, are civil society leaders engaged in assisting, advocating for, and providing services to migrants. Next, we'll hear from Lindsay Jenkins. She is a protection officer with the Protection and Solutions Unit of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR Regional Office in Washington, D.C. Her work covers a range of protection issues in the United States, including the response to forced displacement, which is often uh, overlooked in this debate about migration, the internal displacement elements of it uh, from North, the North America, I mean, from the Northern Triangle of Central America. She works on capacity building, access to asylum, detention alternatives, uh, and, 
detention and alternatives to detention for asylum seekers and statelessness. Um, and she joined uh, us in a presentation of the um, uh, UNHCR's report, um, Girls on the Run, I believe it's called, uh, that was presented by then Commissioner for the uh, UNHCR, um, human, uh, UN Commission for uh, Refugees, who is now the Secretary General. So. She's had also a great track record on this. So let me turn it over now to Manuel Orozco. He's the Director of Migration, Remittances, and the Development Program at the Inter-American Dialogue, and more importantly, a swell guy. Thank you, Manuel. And we have just a brief uh, video clip that we want to show before we get uh, to the Q&A. Querido Dios, como en diciembre de ese año unos jóvenes llegaron a mi vida, me cubrieron el rostro y me golpearon hasta que me quedé inconsciente. Le pregunté a uno de los jóvenes qué era lo que estaba pasando. Y me respondió que le agradeciera a mi hermano porque estaba ahí. Ese día fue un infierno para mí. Me tocaron y me violaron. No sentía en mi cuerpo del dolor que tenía. Luego me enteré por qué me pasó eso. Mi hermano me contó que cuando vivía con mis tíos, los pandilleros de la Mara Salvatrucha, me dijeron que tenía que formar parte de la pandilla. Cuando mi hermano se negó a ayudarlos, ellos le dijeron que se iba a vengar. Ahora soy refugiada en Panamá, entré a la escuela y pensé que iba a ser bullying, pero fue al contrario. Cuando conté lo que pasó a unas amigas, ellas me apoyaron y me ayudaron. Gracias al apoyo de ellas, ya no lloraba ni tenía temor de que ellos vinieran a buscarme. Estoy contenta porque hoy tengo una buena relación con mi hermano. Él me pidió perdón de lo que pasó y cuando los dos decidimos dejar el pasado atrás y tratar de superar las cosas. Dios, gracias por estar en mis momentos difíciles y porque pusiste en mi camino personas que me apoyaron. Estoy lista para luchar, lista para que mi vida empiece y que mis sueños se hagan realidad. Con amor desde Centroamérica. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me let me start with the the this panel discussion on uh, gender violence and migration uh, with with one fact, one issue, and then four major trends that are shaping Central America right now. The first one is that since the post Civil War period, uh, female migration from Central America, not just from the Northern Triangle has been growing significantly from 40%, perhaps now to over 50% of all migrants uh, that come to the United States in particular. Uh, this has accentuated particularly since 2009 uh, in co coincidence with the global uh, recession, but also with the military coup in Honduras that destabilized the country significantly and had damaging effects even as of today. Um, one of the issues that we see today is uh, we estimate that last year nearly half a million Central Americans, people from the Northern Triangle in particular, uh, attempted ent to enter the United States. Only perhaps 100,000 made it, half of which are women, and the other one are family units, unaccompanied minors, and some adults. The magnitude of the problem got more accentuated this year, where we estimate that nearly one million people will actually try to come to the U.S. Um, the issues that are shaping this include an ecosystem of organized crime, one of the major problems in the region, but particularly uh, in the context of uh, an obsolete model of economic growth in the region. Uh, these are two powerful forces that are pushing people out to migrate. But you also have another context that is very important. When we talk about insecurity, we're dealing with, with more substantive issues that have to do with the extent to which victimization against people actually are making them migrate. That victimization 
actually show certain patterns with regards to women. Um, Eric was talking about some of the numbers with regards to um, the violence cases. Uh, in 2017, for the Northern Triangle, only 75,000 cases of violence against women were reported. The number is just, uh, you know, in a region of 30 million people, it's nearly impossible to understand or accept that that's a, a realistic figure. But even within that, we find a strong correlation between migration, especially from high migration areas, and violence against women, particularly in the case of El Salvador. The issue is even when you delve into it, you will find even more dynamics that have to do with how that relates to violence against women, in particular cases of victimization. And third, there is another reality that we can't just neglect. Uh, you can't simply blame the problem of migration, especially female migration, to um, the issue of contemporary violence. This is a society that has been embedded in a history of a culture of violence, but it's a culture of violence that has a very deep-rooted um, subordination of women. Uh, you know, we, we, I call it, uh, in my class, I call it the Trinity, the, o las tres P, el padre de la iglesia, el padre de la familia, y el padre de la patria. It's a gender-dominated context where deviance or efforts to be different or to, ex to present yourself as an equal are responded with violence or with coercion, more particularly. This deep history of violence has translated in continued cases of violence against women. So, so you're confronted with an ecosystem of organized crime, you're confronted with the problem of victimization, and you're confronted with a culture of violence that is gendered predominantly. And then we have a problem of bad timing. And that's basically a context in which there is a neo-nativist anti-immigration policy that is closing the doors to migration. And so, you know, in that sense, the, the title of this panel is actually quite um, appropriate, nowhere to run. Because as a woman, you're actually faced with so many limitations to begin with. And on top of that, the option to vote with your feet is actually um, constrained. So uh, with these distinguished panelists, I have a few questions that I want them to pick on and then allow you to ask them additional questions. Uh, for Maria Claudia, pardon, Claudia Maria. Um, how do you characterize the extent of violence in Honduras, in the Northern Triangle? Eh, ¿Cuál es la magnitud? ¿Cómo dimensiona el problema de la violencia en Honduras, particularmente con el caso de las mujeres? Y en particular, eh, ¿cómo se relaciona con la migración? And Lindsay, um, coming from the UNHCR, how, how do you see is the pattern of this issue of forced migration, particularly as it relates to, to women and girls um, in the Northern Triangle. And Corey, you, you do, you do the, the dirty work to some extent, uh, which is actually commendable. We, we have to deal with these issues on a regular basis, but how would you characterize or profile those clients that come requesting asylum that has, um, basically experience different kinds of victimization. Some of them are related to this video. Uh, others have to do with, you know, women who are kidnapped by uh, drug trafficking networks. It's a common pattern that takes place too. So with that, Claudia Maria, muchas gracias. Muy buenos días. La situación que vimos ahora en la parte del video es lo que vivimos a diario en Honduras y en los países de Centroamérica. Vemos o dimensionamos una violencia estructural. Es decir que no solamente la persona o las mujeres en este caso eh, que son violentadas reciben violencia en sus casas, sino también a través del medio en el que viven, como lo pudimos ver en el video. Y aparte de esto, también es una violencia en la cual no pueden acudir a una institución como un ministerio público o un lugar donde le den respuesta, porque el Estado tampoco tiene la capacidad de poder dar respuesta a estas situaciones que se están viviendo. Entonces, nosotros manejamos eh, esta violencia estructural como un triángulo, ¿no? La violencia eh, familiar, doméstica, sexual, eh, como en este caso del video, 
eh, una violencia también en las calles, hay represión, eh, no hay manera donde eh, poder exponer su situación porque también las institucionalidades, eh, la policía, el Ministerio Público, también están eh, coludidos, eh, no hay eh, respuesta económica tampoco para poder dar respuesta a estas situaciones. Y esto se agrava porque entonces eh, las personas donde acuden cuando tienen una violencia o están, están en estas situaciones, ¿no? El país, eh, en el caso de Honduras, eh, incrementó un 3% en salud y educación y un 7% en un presupuesto para seguridad ciudadana. Pero aún cuando este porcentaje es alto de incremento en el presupuesto, no hay respuesta, sino también bien la situación se agrava. Eh, tanto así de que una persona que llega a, viol a ser violentada y llega a un ministerio público, esa misma persona tendrá que llevar la citatoria a su agresor. Eh, y no hay situaciones en las cuales porque no hay recursos para poder dar respuesta para que esa persona sea citada de manera adecuada durante el proceso. Eh, de toda esa situación, la persona no tiene otra alternativa más que poder entonces acudir a, a refugio o asilos en otros países solventando su situación ya que en Honduras eh, y en el caso de toda Centroamérica en los tres países no es casualidad que los países más violentos sean Honduras, El Salvador y Guatemala Honduras ha sido eh, catalogado como uno de los países más violentos de América Latina al interno eh, y esto es lo que se vive a diario no entonces eh, esta respuesta no es tan fácil darla eh, con un presupuesto eh, el cual no está siendo manejado tampoco a, tan adecuadamente eh, dentro de los ingresos del país cuando la persona no tiene respuesta en sus países eh, entonces tiende a poder migrar y por eso nosotros vimos las situaciones de caravanas ¿sí? de que gran cantidad de personas están migrando en nuestros países siete mil personas más o menos eh, eh, pudieron migrar eh, una cantidad muy grande en nuestro país eh, de acuerdo a la violencia que se está viviendo. Dentro de toda esta situación, eh, nosotros eh, eh, podemos ver en nuestros países que un alto porcentaje de 20 mil personas más o menos de casos que llegan de denuncia de violencias no son resueltos. Hablando un poco dentro del país, eh, entra el 100% de los casos que entra a un ministerio público de situaciones de violencia, el 72% eh, eh, caduca, es decir, no consigue, no sigue un proceso. ¿Por qué? Por situaciones de que la persona, las mujeres tienen miedo de seguir el proceso o porque el tiempo prescribe. El otro porcentaje, que es el 28%, algunos de estos son eh, absolutorios, es decir, de, de, deciden que no tiene razón de ser porque no han sido violentados. La, las mujeres no han sido golpeadas, todavía eh, no está muerta, por lo tanto no hay una respuesta favorable para ellas. En el caso de las respuestas favorables, que eh, son el 20 y algo por ciento, de esas que le dicen que sí, que el Ministerio Público le dice a la mujer o a las personas, usted tiene razón, su, sus derechos han sido violentados y le, el Estado le va a dar una respuesta. Sobre eso tampoco hay una seguridad que la persona pueda tener y poder vivir en el país. Porque no hay una manera en que el Estado pueda asegurarle que eh, sus garantías eh, pueden ser válidas. Es decir, que el agresor puede volver a buscarla y no hay una manera de darle un seguimiento de que están eh, sus derechos adecuadamente eh, solventados. Toda esta situación que se vive en el país, que eh, lo pudimos ver claramente en el video, eh, violaciones, eh, eh, golpes, eh, también una situación de represaria dentro del país, hace de que la persona tenga, no, no hay otra alternativa que poder migrar. ¿Sí? Entonces, esta es más o menos la situación y eh, la tendencia que hemos estado viendo es que antes era el jefe de familia, ¿no? El hombre el que migraba de un hogar y la, la esposa con sus hijos se quedaba. Después hemos estado viendo que es la madre con sus hijos la que está migrando del país y hemos visto también niños solos migrando. Entonces, hay una situación que está siendo, eh, que está cambiando eh, dentro de todo el rango de, de migración que tenemos de nuestros países de Centroamérica del Triángulo Norte. Thank you very much, um, Manuel um, and Michael and Eric, for this attention to this really important issue. Um, obviously, the issue of forced migration out of um, out of the Northern Triangle is not one that we have. It's not a new theme, um, but it is one. This, in particular, is uh, the effect on women 
is one that uh, that needs more attention. So thank you very much for, for having this panel today. Um, I work with the UN Refugee Agency, and it's our um, our job to try and understand the the reasons to identify why people are are fleeing, but also to understand the protection response um, in countries of origin in the region. And so we have been working for for quite some time and following the statistics, and they're very they're very glaring. Let me just go ahead and contextualize forced displacement of women in the overall context. Uh, since 2011, we've seen over 550,000 citizens of the Northern Triangle countries seek asylum elsewhere um, in the world. A at the end of 2018, there were over 350,000 refugees and asylum seekers seeking protection outside of their countries of origin. Um, not only are people displaced uh, internationally, we see high rates of internal displacement. In Honduras, over 174,000 people are considered internally displaced persons, so that's people who have fled their homes, their communities, looking for safety elsewhere in the country. And in El Salvador, we've seen over 70,000, um, over 70,000 people. Within that context, um, women make up a very large portion of, of that flow. Of asylum seekers and refugees, um, overall 40% are women. Um, that uh, that we saw in the end of 2018. And within the internally displaced population, 41% of, uh, of households in, uh, in Honduras were, um, were or, or internally displaced were, were women, and 43% in El Salvador. So the impact, the numbers themselves are, are, are stark and telling. Um, this is all happening in a context where we are now seeing the largest um, situations of displacement in the region since we've seen since the 1980s and 90s, and this is really called upon um, UNHCR, governments in the region, otherwise, to come up with a response that not only addresses some of the root causes, but really protection alongside. Um, this issue of forced displacement of, of women is one, again, since we started talking about this most recently, 2014, 2015, we saw unaccompanied children arriving in greater numbers, fleeing Central America. We saw women with families fleeing. We tried to understand that, and we, um, we put out two reports, children on the run and women on the run. Um, women on the Run, particularly relevant here, where we interviewed over a hundred asylum seekers, uh, women from um, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, trying to understand why they were fleeing. And many of the reasons, all of the context that we've talked about here, the lack of institutional response, the lack of police response, uh, domestic violence, targeting, as we saw, um, using uh, sexual and gender-based violence as a tool of revenge, repression, fear. Um, all of these things we found in the testimonies of the women we spoke to, and you saw very well reflected um, in uh, in the testimony of, of the young woman who is a refugee now in Panama. Um, so these are these are issues that we have known um, under international law. The um, someone who has fled violence has fled persecution on the basis of their gender. Um, when their country is unable or unwilling to protect them, it is well settled under international law that this is a basis for asylum. Um, that this is a basis for a refugee claim. We have found um, in profiling women um, and profiling um, populations who are fleeing the three countries that, um, that, that this dynamic is very real, that women and girls are often faced with this. And so we can say that of the women who are, are fleeing Central America, that there is a large refugee dynamic. It's a mixed flow. We can't deny that. People are leaving for various reasons, but violence oftentimes intersects with many of the economic decisions, the family reunification decisions that help uh, in that help um, motivate someone to to leave their home and seek protection elsewhere. So as we as we face responses, what is there to do? And um, and we have been working with governments in the region. Uh, since 2016, 2017, on a comprehensive regional response, because this is not just an impact in the United States. This is not just an impact in Mexico. This is something that we have 
that all the countries in the region have felt the impact of refugee flows um, out of uh, out of the countries affected. And so there really has to be a regional response. So we have been working on a comprehensive regional protection solutions response that addresses protection in country of origin so that when, uh, when a woman, when a girl is affected by violence, that she can seek effective protection in country um, of origin. And if not, then as we see larger numbers of people seeking asylum in Mexico, in Belize, in Panama, in the United States, that asylum systems are resilient and responsive to the needs, particularly of women and girls, but also to all refugees who are fleeing. And then, very importantly, and this is something I'm sure we'll discuss along the way, but that um, that regionally, globally, there is a response of solidarity, of, um, of responsibility sharing, um, to show support um, alongside for the protection of these folks. These are solutions that are focused on the protection of people during their situation, and in the meantime, while much longer term solutions around root causes, economic development, entrenched poverty, um, uh, violence, institutional issues are being addressed. It is important to have both protection and, um, and, and longer term solutions addressed alongside one another. And that's something that we'd be very happy to discuss more. So thank you again for, uh, for holding this panel. I look forward to hearing more, um, particularly from Corey about how these issues are playing out in, um, in the domestic U.S. asylum context and elsewhere. Hey everyone, can you hear me? Hopefully. Um, so I'm a bit different than some of the, the other individuals involved in this issue because I'm not doing official research on it. I'm working with individuals once they get here um, to you know try to try to help them find a legal way to stay here. But through that process, I interact with hundreds of individuals from Central America and on a long-term basis because asylum cases are taking years. And oftentimes with my clients, they don't tell me until we've known each other for a year that they have been affected by these issues. Um, and I was telling Manuel that I have trouble thinking of a single female client of mine who hasn't experienced domestic violence or sexual assault. And I have hundreds that I've worked with over the past couple of years. Um, now, this is a particular population. This doesn't necessarily represent you know, individuals in these countries as a whole, but we serve, at Ayuda, we serve any immigrant who walks in the door, so we're not advertising if you've been a victim of this, come to us. It's if you're an immigrant and you need legal help, come to us. So um, even knowing about these issues going into this job, I was shocked to see just how prevalent it is. It's essentially 100% of my female clients um, from Central America have, have um, been victims of of violence against women. Um, it's not as as we've been talking about. This is not something new. I have clients um, who have been here for twenty years and were affected by this before they left twenty years ago. But it is it is becoming more prevalent, especially with young girls. Um, gang members are using rape, they're impregnating girls and women as a tool of control in the country and there's not much to there's not much happening to protect them um, many of my clients have told me if there's no blood then the police don't even think about coming and even if there is there's just very little will in the communities to to hold perpetrators accountable especially if they are police government um, gang members which a lot of a lot of these perpetrators are um, as far as how things work on the ground here with immigration court. Things are definitely worse now than they were in past administrations, but it's always been really difficult for domestic violence, sexual assault survivors to get asylum in the United States. This is something that was still very difficult under the Obama administration. Central American asylum cases are not winning for the most part. This is a generalization, of course, um, but it's very difficult to win these cases. And it's very dependent on your region and your judge. So some immigration judges have asylum grant rates of 80%. Some have grant rates of 2%. Um, and because immigration courts are administrative courts, 
there's not the same same rights and procedures as would happen, for example, in a criminal court. So the rules of evidence don't apply. Um, respondents, so immigrants trying to stay here, don't have the right to an attorney, even if they're toddlers. So there are toddlers who are sp supposed to put on their own case. Yes, not a court-appointed attorney, like defendants in many criminal matters do. So they have to pay for an attorney um, or work with a nonprofit. Nonprofits are, you know, there's only so many of us, and um, we are, we have too many clients as it is, and and with cases becoming more difficult and more labor intensive, it, it makes us unable to take as many new new people as as we used to be able to on a regular basis. Um, I'll just tell you about some of the particular issues in immigration court and in the immigration system that that really disproportionately affect um, survivors of gender-based violence. Immigration judges don't have to have any immigration background to become a judge. They also don't have to have background and knowledge of um, issues that, that are affecting the immigrants that come before them. And of course, there's training involved, but it's not, um, it's on laws and procedures and a little bit of what, what people are facing in different regions of the world, but it's lacking perhaps like a trauma-informed um, piece. A lot, I think if you asked immigration judges what they see as the most dangerous country in the world for women and girls right now, very few would say Central America. But research shows us that the Northern Triangle is the most dangerous place in the world, period, right now. If you're looking at homicide, if you're looking um, looking at these different statistics, so there's there's a big misunderstanding, and I think um, underestimation of what things are like in in the Northern Triangle. So there's an expectation that people are coming here for economic reasons, for other reasons, but that it's not that bad. But it is that bad, <laughs> and as my clients will tell me, oftentimes after a lot of time together, it, most people are not only survivors of one incident of violence. It's a constant, um, this constant culture of violence. Most of my teenage clients have witnessed someone being murdered in the streets. And this is not a rarity, this is the norm. Um, recently, not recently, about a year ago, there was a an immigration case that um, came out called Matter of AB. Many of you may have heard of it. That makes it more difficult for survivors of family violence and gang violence to get status in the United States. So while the rates were already not great, it's even more difficult now. And there's some judges that won't even entertain an argument of of asylum based on escaping um, partner violence. So, you know, women are coming here to seek protection and we're not giving it, which is really unfortunate. There's also these recent developments um, with forcing asylum seekers to stay in Mexico while they pursue their case, which procedurally is very difficult. They have to show up on the border, at the border on the day of their case and try to get let in and try to make it to court in time. And um, reports from the border are, are showing that that's not happening. So people are not having access to justice. They're not having the right to present their case, um, which by law we are required to give them. A lot of women also experience violence in, in Mexico on their way here, and now they're being forced to stay there. And there's reports of crimes against asylum seekers um, because they don't have much power in the situation that they're in, robberies, extortion, things like that happening for these groups of people forced to stay in Mexico. And then recently there's been talk about the safe um, third party agreements. And while I have less clients facing um, extreme situations that come from Guatemala and Mexico, they're there. So, I mean, I think it's kind of ironic to call it a safe, a safe um, third country because we have we also have women fleeing from those countries because of the same issues. And while it's not at the same rates, it's happening. And migrant women in particular are especially susceptible to violence in, if they're from, for example, Honduras and El Salvador, they're susceptible to violence at a higher rate than local women in Guatemala and Mexico. So 
for the government to say you should stay there and try to seek protection there is, is not a, a great solution, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the three of you. Uh, I used to say that the, the Central American Northern Triangle migration in particular was perhaps the second or the third largest in the world. I think given the fact that you know the world is not static, it's changing rapidly, um, it's probably the, true that now the Central American Northern Triangle migration is the largest out-migration flow in the world, even surpassing Venezuela and Russia, um, Syria, excuse me, Russia, they don't even migrate. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you are alluding to, to key issues. You talk about structural violence, you talk about the importance of the, the long-term approaches, and you talk about the patterns that you're not just dealing with one single experience. But uh, I want to open the floor for questions and answers, but um, it's just an afterthought that stays with me is, you know, we keep focusing on the relief issues, but we it seems to me that we need immediate responses that address the bigger problem, because although the the current crisis has to be dealt with, we've been dealing with crisis after crisis. We had the 2014 minor crisis, we had uh, the CETAS violence cases in, in 2010, and we can go back past years, and every three year cycles, more or less, there is a major crisis that has to do with people having to flee. So the root causes of the problem continue to be there, so we have to focus on those issues. So the question is, what are the immediate solutions we have to, to deal with that? And on that note, we're going to start with this section, two questions here, two questions there, and two questions there. Um, is there a microphone? Yes, no? Okay, can you speak, um, identify yourself and yell? My name is Alejandra Argueta and I work at the International Justice Mission. I'm working with our programs in Central America. And so my question for the panelists is, if the criminal justice systems in these um, countries, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, if they were able to hold perpetrators accountable, if, if impunity was reduced for these forms of violence, what effect would that have on the push factors? Um, or is it a combination of a criminal justice response and also responding to the very deep-rooted cultural um, uh, causes of this violence? Thank you all. My name is Rebecca Sewell. I'm from Creative Associates. Um, one of the, th and thank you panelists, and I certainly um, applaud the efforts for um, calls for greater attempts to address the impunity and the corruption within the legal systems and within the criminal justice systems and asylum seeking systems throughout the, the process. But getting back to your point about gender-based violence and other types of violence against women, I mean, this is not a new phenomenon. I mean, it's increased, but it's not a new phenomenon. Um, the femicide rates in these countries are the highest in the world, right? So in essence, what's being done, I mean, all these women are being killed, but, and obviously sparring other women to flee, but to me, the issue is how do we address both the, the causes of violence, because it's not the women who are causing the violence, it's the women who are victims of the violence, and what kinds of programmings, now that we have lots of great models coming from South Africa, coming from Rio, um, to deter and to engage men to stop gender-based violence, are those viable options in the countries of the Northern Triangle? Have they been tried? Have they been worked? And is this something we might be focusing on? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here. And the gentleman there, then. 
Hi, uh, thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, I think this, it's very important to talk about this topic because it's a topic that besides the women on the run report, uh, no one talks about it. Las novias, the, the female that are being like, uh, murdered literally uh, at high rates in, in Central America. Uh, I guess my question is more related to uh, UNHCR and the application of the MIRPS in the region and how is the MIRPS covering this issue, if at all. Um. The gentleman, and if you can please identify yourself. Uh, yes, my name is John Elliott. I'm with the Department of State in the Office of Global Women's Issues. And I have a statement and then a, a comment and then a question. Uh, my comment is that I believe one of the areas that needs to be addressed in combating gender-based violence is the media, the role of the media in the entertainment industry. And I've seen this all throughout Latin America, uh, that uh, the entertainment industry and the media and the novellas are not really assuming the role of being leaders in affecting social change. And I think this is something that could be uh, done with grassroots, uh, on the grassroots level. And my question is, uh, I'd like to know about what's happening to the people who are re rejected and returned to uh, Central America. For example, the embassy in Honduras reports that 30% of those uh, who enter the United States are being returned. Uh, so where are they ending? Uh, what's the recidivism rate? How many of them are returning to the United States for another second or third or tenth attempt? Um, or are they being more victimized? Are they being put at the bottom of the social ladder? Thank you. Hi, my name is Chloe Gilroy. I'm a graduate student at Georgetown. I was wondering what type of policing model you think is needed to help women in the Northern Tri Triangle better access justice so that they can um, reach better outcomes either in case or case their cases or through the court system um, in their respective countries. Dentro de las respuestas, eh, hay dos caminos acá dentro de, de dar soluciones a esta problemática. Uno son las respuestas inmediatas. Dentro de esto, eh, se ha creado fiscalías de la mujer eh, para poder solventar como ventanillas únicas, ¿no? Donde pueden llegar las personas eh, afectadas. Eh, también se ha depurado la policía militar, se han hecho acciones para la depuración de la policía militar eh, y la policía eh, que puede atender al orden público. Eh, también algunas eh, soluciones eh, estructurales pues a, se han creado las leyes eh, nosotros estamos eh, como organización y apoyado con otras organizaciones fomentando una ley integral contra la violencia de las mujeres eh, esto está en el Congreso Entonces, es una acción inmediata, eh, inmediata. y solventando un pro, eh, la estructura penal de nuestro país que, que se han hecho estos avances en leyes en depuraciones eh, no solventamos completamente el problema, eh, porque son problemas estructurales. Uno va a solución desde cómo cambiar la estructura de gobierno ¿no? que tenemos nosotros en nuestros países en, en Centroamérica eh, para que no haya tanta corrupción. Otra es el, el manejo de los impuestos que se manejan eh, y los porcentajes para cada una de estas dependencias que dan respuesta a estas situaciones. Eh, otra es, es las eh, políticas públicas eh, y las leyes que los países deben de estar orientadas a, a, al individuo realmente y no solamente eh, 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 hacerlo ¿no? en una oficina estas leyes. Y aquí involucra pues esa participación ciudadana que es la que nosotros estamos tratando de desarrollar dentro de nuestros países para que haya un involucramiento directamente de los afectados. Porque una persona de que... Eh, que se siente amenazada en nuestros países, hay un desplazamiento interno forzado inicialmente. Después viene un desplazamiento ya hacia otros países porque no hay una respuesta al, al, en el sistema completo, no solamente en el sistema judicial y penal, 
sino es en el sistema completo de cómo se maneja las democracias y los impuestos y el dinero de nuestros países y la participación que se le da al ciudadano. Eh, y hay este desplazamiento, por lo tanto, eh, también debe haber algunas políticas, ¿no? De manejo de migración, de asilo, de refugiado y mejorar esta parte también, eh, porque es un derecho cuando el Estado de, de Honduras o de nuestros países no le da respuesta, ¿cómo solventar, ¿no? Esta situación. Entonces, eh, por ahí va. So I think um, maybe just very quickly starting with the, the femicide question that this is not a new phenomenon. Um, and I think, you know, as long as I've been working on this issue, that's actually been a very, a very present concept, a very present reality for many of, um, of the women and girls in the, in the region. Um, what I think I will say, you know, as we see more and more women and girls fleeing, um, seeking protection either in other parts of the country or outside of their country, You know, it is uh, situated in a context of overall forced displacement and a lot of these issues. I think there've been, there's been actually really good work um, done understanding that when someone, you can live in a context where this is a reality and violence against women and violence against children is a reality, but not until you feel threatened yourself individually do you actually make the decision to, to leave and move and, and you do that very quickly. Um, I, so I think to the extent that uh, building up systems of accountability and responsiveness uh, will go a long way towards addressing that. But in the meantime, building up protection systems that actually respond to the specific needs of women and girls. And that, I think, really goes to the, the MIRPS question, MIRPS being the Marco Integrado Regional de Protección y Soluciones. This is that comprehensive regional protection and response framework that, um, that I was talking about. Um, that brings what, that's actually led by countries in the region, both countries of origin and countries of asylum, Uh, to come up with a response to address these, these needs, in-country protection needs. Asylum systems make them more responsive to, uh, to the needs of, of, of women and the particular experiences that they've, they've had along the way. Some of those vulnerabilities that you're talking about that exist in country of asylum. Um, so we have seen within the overall MIRPS framework, there are specific actions that go towards, um, trying to identify the protection needs of women when they're in country and get them better access to protection, um, if they're fleeing Um, if you're fleeing domestic violence or other violence, trying to access any of the protection mechanisms that exist at a local level, and also trying to help countries better understand the dynamics of protection, protection needs that women have in their countries of origin. But once a woman has fled or once a girl has fled and is seeking asylum in another country, having asylum authorities well briefed on identifying these particular issues, both in terms of the legal analysis that goes into a claim for asylum based on gender-based violence but all and understanding country of origin conditions but also um, in some of the asylum systems in the region you do have an element where the asylum authorities play a protection role and so they're able to when someone comes before them and identifies as an, as an asylum seeker they actually have an ability to um, Um, I'm trying to think, to channel uh, that, that individual towards services that might be responsive to some of the needs that, that she has. Because having been, an, uh, having experienced trauma and violence, having to recount your story again to asylum officials can also be very tra tra traumatic and place vulnerabilities. So, um, so, so there's that element of it as well. And then in terms of regional response to, um, And, uh, responsibility sharing, you know, uh, making sure that countries of resettlement understand the dynamics and identify, um, vulnerable women for resettlement out of the region. Um, and then finally, also to your question about the, the recidivism piece. Um, I don't have the numbers on recidivism, but what I can say is we know very well from our experience around the world that if a circumstance that led someone to flee in the first place is not addressed and they're returned, then we know that that person will likely displace again. That's a very, it's a cycle of displacement. Um, one of the, um, for, for people who have, have, have left and been deported back from whatever country, um, our colleagues on the ground in countries of origin uh, have been working to develop protection protocols to help authorities identify people with ongoing protection needs to help them figure out the best solution for, for that as well. But thank you for flagging that. Um, something that I 
tell a lot of people about um, immigration in general when they're asking about my job is that people don't want to permanently leave their country. They don't want to go on a horrible journey where they don't have food or water for days or weeks um, to go to a country where they don't know the language um, where they'll have to most likely do a job that's menial labor or will they'll be treated um, badly and never get to visit their home country again. That's not something that people want to do. And so I think any improvement in the countries of origin, we call it home country in immigration law, any improvements in the home countries would reduce the migration. As far as um, reducing impunity, I think that's only one piece of it because many women are not economically able to be a single woman or a single mother. So there are, there are reasons beyond, um, you know, lack of police response and lack of of accountability for violence that keep women in relationships. Another reason that many women would not want to leave a relationship is because single women and single mothers are at increased risk of attention from gangs because they don't have a man in the house. So while I think, you know, reducing impunity is a, is a great first step, there's a lot of other pieces that would have to go along with it in order, in order for women to truly be able to to leave problematic relationships. Um, as far as people that are returned home, from what I've seen in my practice, the people that are able to return again to the United States tend to be men because of economic reasons, because of family ties and things like that. Um, I, when I do intakes for new clients, it's much more common for me to see men that have come back and forth several times because it's so expensive for people to be able to come. And it's such a dangerous journey, particularly for women and children. I see a lot less of that population um, that's, that's able to try again. And for people that have been deported or have voluntarily left once, once they come back again, it's much harder for them to seek relief here in the United States. So their situation is even more difficult than um, people who are coming to the US for the first time. And from what I've heard from clients and former clients, people who arrive back in home country after having been in the United States are at increased risk of violence, extortion. People are seen as rich that have been in the United States. Um, oftentimes people have adapted to the American way of life. They're Americanized. They have different standards, different, um, a different culture really. You know, they've, they've adapted and, and mixed the culture of where they came from with the culture of, of how their lives were here. And so many times their lives are even more difficult than they were before they left. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. Um, I just wanted to add to the criminal justice question because uh, I think it brings back these bigger structural matters. Reducing impunity will likely have an effect in mitigating the push factors, but it, it won't stop the out-migration process. I mean, for different reasons. One of them is that um, you're still not reducing the scale of, my, of violence, but th there are bigger problems that have to do with the social norms. I think your, your comment about the media is just a, you know, an illustration of the extent to which social norms in Central America are deeply uh, rooted on a very, um, you know, gender division, the discriminating context that put women in a much more vulnerable situation. So those roles don't contribute at all. Um, and so you have to deal with issues of economic integration, for example, the extent to which women are less likely to find a formal job uh, in their home country is much higher than among males. Um, that, that in itself is a major barrier. Uh, in addition to being confronted with violence. And the, the, to the other question of, of migrant recidivism, um, those who have been apprehended are much less likely to return, to, to try again, because it's expensive. Um, those who have been in the U.S. and are deported, they, they are more likely to return. The question is when and what share of those people who actually migrated and were deported 
um, are representing this sample of this pop this population that is migrating. Um, my my own observations is that it's very small. Uh, in a project we had in Guatemala, um, we found that one percent of people we work with we work with one hundred and fifty thousand people had a relative who had been returned. And they had been in the United States for nine years, and they were working in agriculture. They had to go back to the lowest paid job in Guatemala. So chances are this person is going to find a way to return uh, to the U.S. as soon as he finds $7,000 at hand to get, come across. Now, relative to all the deportations, you have 30,000 people deported to Guatemala every year. So if it's 1%, it's 300 people who will attempt to come back. Um, but the, the, the pattern is likely to be there. It's small, but uh, it tells you something of the issue. So we had, oh, there was a lady who left. She probably wasn't happy. Uh, so we have a question here. We have a question there and a question back there. Thanks. Hi. Okay. People here? Okay. Um, my name is Valerie. I'm uh, at the Institute for Women's Policy Research. I'm a postdoc uh, fellow. Uh, I have a question about the numbers when it comes to um, asylum seekers. So I heard, for instance, that about 40% of the asylum seekers are women from the Northern Triangle. But how is that um, registered? Like when somebody is, when, if it's a family unit, for instance, is it labeled as being the man who's the asylum seeker or is, it, or is the 40% just single women with children or not? Or, you know, can you give us, us a little bit more detail on how we can um, because I guess I'm trying to see out of the 60% that would be male, uh, are these, do these include couples where women might actually be in those numbers too? Thank you. Good morning. I'm Zachary Orrin with USAID in Guatemala. I, and my question refers to how migrants conceptualize being a victim of violence, among other factors, and in, in migration, how do they see it? Do they see it as a motivation? Do they see arriving in the United States as addressing the gender-based violence that they experience? Um, we've talked about economic and other motivators, but how do they put it in? Thanks. Uh, Thomas Jeffrey from U.S. Department of State, Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. So. My question is, um, are there creative different ways to address the root issues at the local level? And then also focusing on governance, how could you engage with local governments on addressing gender-based violence? Dentro de algunas iniciativas que se están haciendo eh, más comunitarias y, y municipales, eh, uno es la policía municipal, o sea, que ya no sea los militares como actualmente es en nuestro país, sino que sea eh, más esa parte. Y se está um, abogando un poco más por la prevención que por estar solucionando estos problemas estructurales ¿no? y, y, y de la situación que hay. Y la otra es la parte de educación. Eh, estamos eh, haciendo proyectos eh, en las escuelas, desde la, el área preescolar, las escuelas, para poder eh, cambiar esa cultura de violencia que hay en nuestros países, eh, cultura de género, eh, antiviolencia, anticorrupción, valores, para poder crear esa generación nueva dentro de las comunidades. La otra es que estamos haciendo políticas públicas municipales eh, participativas, es decir, tenemos mesas comunitarias 
en las cuales sociedad civil, el gobierno municipal, líderes comunitarios, organizaciones que trabajan en el entorno, nos reunimos en una mesa para poder establecer políticas, eh, eh, maneras de gestionar dentro de los municipios y proyectarnos, ¿no? Un plan eh, de proyección del municipio, tanto en la parte económica como en la parte de reducción de violencia y hacia dónde va el municipio, como un plan, una visión. Eh, municipal. Y todo eso lo estamos haciendo a través de la MON, que es la, so, eh, la que asocia a todas las municipalidades, y ahora estamos en unas pruebas piloto específicamente en algunas comunidades puntuales, y de aquí a unos dos años vamos a poder ver cuánto es la diferencia de reducción de la violencia, de índices de violencia en estos municipios, para poder eh, hacer eh, institucionalizado este procedimiento y poderlo replicar en otras comunidades. Esto es a nivel local, pero también nosotros estamos haciendo incidencia a, a nivel central, es decir, eh, reunirnos con la primera dama, que tiene que ver un poco con, con la parte de las mujeres, también con los gobiernos, hacer incidencia en organismos internacionales para que podamos tener ese soporte interno. Eh, que nosotros como hondureños o como salvadoreños o guatemaltecos también tengamos propuestas de mejora dentro de nuestros países eh, que tiene que ver cambios estructurales grandes, ¿no? Eh, no solamente es la violencia, es el desempleo, es la corrupción, es la falta de, de incentivos y de recursos dentro de los países. Entonces, tiene que ver eh, algunas otras eh, condicionantes que provocan toda esta parte de violencia. Entonces, en esta parte estamos trabajando a nivel eh, central y también a nivel ya más comunitario. Um, I'll start with your question about the data. Oh, data. Um, it's such a challenge. It really is. Um, you know, we actually, our statistics are global statistics. We, in some cases, we rely on government reporting, and in other cases, we're able to collect it ourselves. In much of the region, it's government reported, um, but we are able to get disaggregated data, and we try, and we report out on individual claims. So if you do have, if you have um, a, a single woman, female head of household, and she flees with her children, then her children will be counted individually and she will be counted as an individual asylum seeker. So we do our best um, to, to work with governments to figure out how we can disaggregate that. I will say, um, you know, we have, there are growing numbers of asylum seekers from, um, uh, from uh, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, throughout the region. Um, the United States continues to be the largest recipient and we aren't actually able to get disaggregated data from the U.S. government and, and report it. So, so within that 40%, Um, it actually may potentially even be a, a bit higher. We just don't, we, we, we don't have a way of reporting. But of the data that we do have, 40% um, um, are, of them are women, and then that doesn't account for girls as well. Um, but better data is always better. Um, I will say also uh, in response to the questions about whether or not um, refugees, uh, asylum seekers, as distinguished from migrants particularly, um, how they see uh, access to asylum as a solution to the violence that they're facing. I think that really depends on um, on a lot. You know, when we're working with governments anywhere in the world, and can in, uh, including in the region, to build up access to asylum and the ability to understand a claim, may, the understand the ability to make a claim, um, have access to a meaningful procedure. We're not just doing that. We're also working to focus on integration prospects as well um, and building up the ability for someone to rebuild their lives somewhere. So if someone is recognized as a refugee um, but still feels vulnerable for whatever reason, then they might not see that as a solution. So for instance, in, in Mexico, which we have seen drastic increases in the number of people seeking asylum, we're talking in 2014, around 2,100 claims were filed in Mexico. So last year, 29,000 were filed, and we're looking at up to somewhere between 60 and 80,000 this year. So the Mexican asylum system is really taking off, and so our colleagues are working very creatively, uh, partnering with the private sector to try, and um, particularly in um, in the northern central region of, of Mexico, to um, to have asylum seekers and refugees matched with um, job uh, prospects. And particularly for a single woman head of household, that's that's critical. Um, that that is something that is a is a dynamic that she has faced across her her lifetime, and really helping her find stability that can actually help provide together with refugee protection, a real meaningful solution to the violence that perhaps she fled in the first place. So my thoughts on that. Were you, were you also asking how much being a victim 
of violence plays into someone's decision to to migrate? Was that part of the question? Okay. Right, okay, I just wanted to clarify. Um, so a lot of individuals give what I call the Miss America answer, you know, world peace for everyone. If you ask an individual, why did you come to the United States? A lot of people will say, there are better opportunities here, period. Um, and when people enter the country and are first asked if they're afraid to go back to their home country and asked why they're coming, they've just been through a really difficult journey. It's usually a male customs and border patrol officer asking them. Oftentimes their Spanish isn't great. They're in detention. It's a, it's a very overwhelming situation. And so a lot of people just give fluff answers. What I see, I mean, oftentimes when I ask my clients for the first time, so why did you come to the United States? I do get a fluff answer, but I dig deeper. And usually it is a safety concern, whether that's because of gang violence, partner violence, family violence, um, is one of the main motivating factors. They were fearful that the, the violence was turning lethal, and, and so they fled to the United States. Now, of course, there are better economic opportunities in the United States, and there are other factors that I'm sure are a, a bonus <laughs> for people, people deciding to come here. But once you dig deeper, I find that with, with most of my clients, violence is a huge factor once I've built a, a trustful relationship with them. Um, many of my clients don't self-identify as victims of trafficking or victims of violence. You know, avoidance is a, is a coping mechanism for many people. There's also this idea that domestic violence is allowed, and so you don't complain about it. And so oftentimes people don't, don't want to be seen as complaining about their partner out of, out of embarrassment, even though that, that was a big factor. Um, just real quickly on, on ways to deal with this on the ground and, you know, working with local governments. I think it's hard to work on one particular issue when the situation is so unstable. So if you can online find maps of San Salvador, where by neighborhood, they have it coded who's in control. So there's two gangs. And there's the government. There's three different factors. And it will go by city blocks. And so it's hard to institute any program to help, I mean, really with any issue, with economic development, with violence against women, when you go to a different block and somebody else is in charge and they have different rules. Thank you. We have a few more minutes for extra questions. You, your, your question to me is, is really important because I call it, um, that Central Americans in general, but women in particular, have mucha costra. You know, you have a lot of thick skin. And we, when we do service in the U.S. to migrants and we ask them why they come, the large majority of the answers are economic reasons. When we talk to them, uh, on another study we did recently, we ask about different questions relating to economic and insecurity issues. Less than, less than 5% of women say they have been uh, physically or sexually abused. Now, that was actually statistically correlated to the intention to migrate. And that amounts to more than 1 million people. And, you know, when you compare that to the 75,000 cases, that just doesn't, you know, uh, correspond at all. So, in general, you do have thick skin. You don't think that what's going on in your context uh, from verbal abuse, which is the most typical thing, to physical abuse, uh, that that might be a determinant factor for you to migrate. Ultimately, is the triggering factor that maybe someone in your family was killed, or you just can't no longer sustain your family the way you have been doing it because you just can't make ends meet. But there is a big, there is a baggage that includes the the social norms, the effect of social norms in the country. Um, we have a question here, uh, another here, and over there. Sorry. Hi, I'm Maria Hernandez from PAI. 
And my question is kind of two part. One, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about some of this in country situations in which you see like targeted state violence um, and sort of like a lack of follow up and this impunity. Um, but also in El Salvador, I think the situation is going to get worse. And sort of talking about this new administration that's taking a strong stand on policing and on targeting social violence is still kind of leaving women alone and as victims. So I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that. Good morning. Um, my name is Alexis De Simone from the Solidarity Center. Um, I wanted to dig a little deeper on the question about programs on the ground and then also ask a little bit about decent work in Mexico um, when you mentioned the private sector helping women um, enter into the workforce after they migrate. Um, so we work with worker rights organizations on the ground throughout um, Central America. Um, we have offices in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And we work on gender-based violence in the world of work um, based on the recognition that a lot of the gender-based violence that happens not only in the workplace but on the commute when you work in Guatemala and you have to wait between two shifts for the maquila to be closed between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. You're very vulnerable on the street. Um, but addressing it from the fact that a lot of this violence comes rooted in the imbalance of power between genders and the fact that men have a very important role not only to not be perpetrators of violence but also to interrupt and not be bystanders when they see their union sisters being victimized. All that to say, um, we're also aware of a lot of other really important programs that are now jeopardized because uh, the U.S. government will no longer be funding assistance programs in the Northern Triangle. I wanted to know if you guys could point to any other major institutions that are going to be continuing or ideally filling in the gaps that we see coming down the pike with this freeze on assistance to the Northern Triangle. Um, and then the other piece of it, because we work very closely with maquila workers um, and my colleagues that work in Mexico report very similar issues in the maquila industry in Mexico. What um, precautions are being taken to make sure that women who are leaving, perhaps an employer who's abusing them um, sexually on the job in San Pedro Sula, when they end up in Northern Mexico, aren't in the exact same situation. Thank you. Um, oh, by the way, my name is Lorraine. I'm working for the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, Lindsay, you'd mentioned that gender-based violence is a recognized basis for seeking um, asylum or refugee status, but Corey, you said that these cases aren't getting won, so I'm. this is a, a question for you mostly. I'm wondering if the issue is that it's not um, recognized as a legal basis for uh, seeking asylum, or if it's a question of the judge's discretion, um, not convincing them or them thinking it's a token excuse or something. Thank you. Hi, I'm Begonia Fernandez from Together for Girls, and mine is a comment more than a question, but um, I just haven't heard as much uh, spoken today about the overall prevalence of violence, of gender-based violence in these countries. And I wanted to call attention to one important resource published this year, which are the Violence Against Children and Youth Surveys. And these were conducted in Honduras and El Salvador. Uh, they're nationally representative household surveys of 13 to 24 year old um, adolescents and youth who, and give national level estimates of the prevalence of sexual, physical, and emotional violence. And I won't get into the details of those findings, but it's really important to have uh, that sort of national level data. And what we found is that for young women who reported experiencing sexual violence before age 18 in Honduras, half reported that the perpetrator was a family member, and in El Salvador it was a quarter. So. Just to reiterate that not to minimize the magnitude or impact of gang violence in these two countries, but violence is really starting in the home. And um, I'm glad, uh, Maria Claudia, you mentioned that all the prevention efforts um, that are being done in Honduras, and I think we really need to start talking more about prevention and really start funding prevention, um, not at the expense of response, but really to increase that pot so that we can adequately address those root causes. Thanks. Eh, voy a ir de atrás hacia, hacia adelante. Eh, en cuanto a la parte de violencia, eh, 
eh, como tú lo decías, la violencia comienza en casa, la violencia doméstica, ¿no? Eh, después, en la calle, igual hay una violencia alrededor, en el entorno, eh, hay una violencia en las instituciones eh, que deberían de dar la justicia y el Estado. Entonces, hay como una cadena, ¿no?, de violencia y esa es la situación que se vive tanto en Honduras, El Salvador y Guatemala y esto es lo que desemboca en un eh, desplazamiento forzado de una comunidad a otra. Eh, las mujeres migran a otra comunidad y ahí también vuelven a sufrir violencia porque la violencia va como algo cultural dentro de las situaciones y eso es uno de los factores que nosotros estamos tratando eh, de la prevención, como tú decías, que ese mayor porcentaje y esa la incidencia que queremos hacer en nuestros países, que haya un mayor porcentaje que se utiliza, eh, hablaba de un 7% del incremento del porcentaje de, de, de ingreso del presupuesto de nuestro país en seguridad pero esa seguridad eh, es simplemente armas eh, como capacitar a los policías, en uniformes, no en prevención de la violencia. Y eso es lo que nosotros estamos tratando de hacer incidencia en que ese porcentaje, una parte se utilice en prevención y en concientización y en la parte de género, tanto a las mujeres como a los hombres, poder cambiar esa, esa mentalidad porque es un problema también cultural de, de, dentro de la violencia. Eh, dentro de esto, eh, también eh, estaba la parte de, de los jueces, eh, cómo deciden catalogar, por acá había un comentario de cómo catalogan eh, la parte de la violencia. Eh, no solamente es que las mujeres sufren la violencia dentro del país, sino que va a una instancia o una institución que debería de, de poderle solventar su problema y ahí no es catalogado como un femicidio o como una violencia doméstica. Entonces, esa cate categorización que le damos en nuestras instancias de, de justicia, de, de penal y de justicia legal, eh, también hay un problema ahí. Porque entonces no se está visualizando realmente el problema como debería de ser. Y por lo tanto, eh, aún los indicadores que está, hay un porcentaje mayor entonces de la violencia que nosotros estamos teniendo, porque cuando llegan a estas instancias no es catalogado como tal. Y ahí estamos tratando de hacer incidencia a través de leyes, a través de capacitaciones y a través de cambios estructurales para que puedan ser identificados. Una persona en una comunidad acude a la alcaldía, acude al juez, y ahí es donde nosotros estamos tratando de hacer hacer esa capacidad de auditoría social, que sea la misma comunidad, las mismas instancias que están dentro de cada comunidad, que puedan verificar que estos casos están siendo titulados como tales. Eh, y la otra parte, la protección en contra de la violencia en trabajo, eh, que hablábamos de las maquilas en la zona norte, eh, aparte de la violencia doméstica, también está la violencia eh, laboral, Aquí hay una gran brecha de discriminación en cuanto a hombres, mujeres, cómo son tratados dentro de la parte del trabajo. Y aquí estamos tratando de hacer incidencia en el Ministerio de Trabajo, en el Ministerio Penal. Todavía no hay eh, respuestas eh, ni soluciones, porque como tú decías, eh, llegan a los trabajos, son violentadas y también cuando salen. Entonces, eh, es y no hay manera de quejarse en ningún, en el sistema todavía no hay una manera de quejarse en la parte laboral en, en contra de eso, porque es, bueno, usted trabaja y, y vea cómo hace, ¿no? Eh, entonces, esa parte también eh, tenemos esa gran deuda con, eh, con esta parte y estamos tratando de hacer incidencias en instancias correspondientes. Eh, y la última, eh, en contra de las mujeres en la parte de, de El Salvador y de Honduras, eh, aquí lo que estamos tratando nosotros es de poder empoderar a las mujeres, a las niñas, eh, para que puedan tener esa voz, eh, lo que estamos tratando es de, de capacitar y poder llevarlas a, a las instancias correspondientes. Eh, no es una respuesta eh, tan a corto plazo porque tiene que ver con incidencia, con cambios de gobierno eh, y involucramiento. Eh, y ahí también tenemos pues esa gran brecha eh, que igual que en El Salvador sucede en Honduras eh, y esta parte de la violencia. Um, just wanted to um, to thank Alexis for for raising this really important issue um, of the idea of how uh, violence and structural violence against women can be perpetrated along the way in someone's journey to protection. Um, and I do think, and this is something that we're very aware of as we um, as we've undertaken these programs in our um, in uh, Mexico in Costa Rica. Um, and I think one of the main ways in which um, 
we are able to, I think this actually highlights a really important aspect of, of our work, which is partnering with civil society organizations um, on these these sorts of issues. I know at least in one location in Mexico, uh, we're working with a with a local partner to um, to access and place folks in this. But it is incredibly important to have um, to have oversight and partnership on educating um, employers around these sorts of issues along the way as well. And so. Um, Thank you very much for raising that issue. Um, additionally, I would just say also, I, I wanted to flag, and thank you for raising the Violence Against Children and Youth Survey as well, and just to point out that um, not only are women fleeing because of violence that they have experienced themselves, but because you have so many women who are single mothers, head of household, even if they haven't necessarily experienced violence themselves, when their children are threatened, um, they oftentimes make the decision to to leave and travel with them. So not only um, are, are are women affected, but their their children, and they're leaving to protect their children as well. Um, going back to those statistics that I gave earlier about um, internal displacement in um, in Honduras and El Salvador, um, I I think I said actually four in the forty percent, but actually it's fifty four percent of IDPs in El Salvador are women, and forty one percent are children. Um, so it just gives you a very stark understanding of what the dynamics are and when someone displaces internally and then has that that oftentimes if they don't get protection that's a that's another move so but regarding the difficulty of these cases winning I'll give kind of an overview and then if you'd like to talk after I'm happy to talk specifics um, so asylum law originally was seen to protect things like race religion, national origin, not necessarily to protect people fleeing family violence. The way that these cases fit in are under particular social group. So one of the ways that you can get asylum is by proving that you were persecuted based on an immutable characteristic, your, partic your particular social group. Um, there has been in the past success with fitting gender into that. Now that's not really enough. You women unable to leave their domestic relationships, that's a common particular social group that's put forward. But the law itself says particular fo so social group and then there's cases that kind of um, flesh that out. So it's the law is not super clear in this area and you can see as um, time goes on the way that the decisions kind of ebb and flow depending on who's in charge and, and how they've been told to interpret the law in those cases. So clarity on these issues, uh, like some binding precedent would be something that could help. Um, in immigration court, certain decisions are binding, but a lot of them aren't because it's this weird administrative court. And so a lot of it can depend on um, what state you live in, how your chances of success. There's been a lot of pushes to take immigration courts out of the administrative court sphere and you know make them a more formal judicial court. Something like that could help as well because we would be setting precedent as we take these cases up. So I, I can have two very similar cases in the same week in front of two different judges and get totally different results. I can also have two similar cases with the same judge a year apart and get two different results, depending on what instructions they are getting, right? You know, we want to construe this more conservatively or we want to be more liberal with what fits into a particular social group. The other challenge with the Central American asylum cases is that it's oftentimes not the government that's persecuting the individual, it's either gangs or citizens it's much easier to win a case when the government is the one persecuting. Um, so part of the challenge is proving that gangs are operating as a quasi-government because the, you know, they're, they're running the neighborhood, the city, the country, you know. Um, and then judges will often want to see that the individual could not have internally relocated, which for many people is impossible to try before they come. I, I always say it's like you have to have tried and failed at several things to have a really good case. You also have to experience harm, but not lethal harm, because you need proof 
it can't be that you thought it was going to happen. In some other types of cases, that can work, but just in general in Central America, the things they're looking for in the case are very difficult to prove. There's also a lack of evidence because oftentimes when you call the police, the police aren't making reports. Or if there is a report, somebody has to go get it, and that can be very dangerous. It can be in a different part of town that's controlled by a different gang. If you flee, you know, for your life, you're not thinking about going down to the police station and getting a report. So I'm happy to talk more after, but there's some particular challenges that make actually winning a case harder than than what the law the law would make it appear. Well, thank you very much. Um, we basically we, we have two formidable challenges. One is how to deal with uh, doubling efforts to ensure that asylum relief is actually uh, fair or fairer. And the second one is how to deal with the root causes of these problems that perhaps are pretty much connected to each other. And along those lines, I, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming here and talk about these issues. The, you know, the, the labor issue is music to every, should be music to everyone's ears. Honduras only has less than 100 labor inspectors for a country with a labor force of more than 5 million people. So you can imagine, <laughs> you, just, you know, it's just, it's crazy. Nicaragua has 10, by the way. <laughs> so it's a country of 5 million people. So who are you going to inspect? Who knows? But definitely there is a lack of enforcement of the law in practical terms, territorially, in all of these countries. And thank you for coming, and we look forward to continue pushing the envelope on these issues with more uh, solutions and creative approaches. Thank you.